conscious the development of conscious alternatives. But it was not until the Amazon that I saw that this was possible in a way that was accessible to me. So then I concentrated on those people, those chemical families, and that uh, that then became the compass for all the work that I've done since then. And uh, I regard the degree more or less as a joke because uh, it was self-directed study. They don't really, uh, there is no degree in shamanism. But my interest was basically one in the phenomenology of religious experience, religious traditions worldwide, and uh, primitive people against a background of tropical nature. And uh, stumbled on to the mushrooms in the jungles of Colombia in 1971 and was not even particularly interested in mushrooms at the time. We were looking for a less well-understood drug that is still not discussed much in the literature, but exists in a very circumscribed area among three Indian tribes. And we went into the jungle to stay at a mission that served these Indians. And the priest at this mission had cleared pasture and brought in white cows. And there were many, many of these mushrooms. And as soon as we started experimenting with them, I realized that what I had been told about psilocybin, which was that it was analogous to LSD, but simply required a larger amount for the effect to be present, was uh, a complete simplification of the issue. And actually then psilocybin became the focus of my interest, and by extrapolation, the other uh, tryptamine-related hallucinogens. And uh, a great dream of mine and of my brothers as well was that the mushroom would somehow be made accessible to people so that they may judge for themselves the difference. And uh, we worked with this over a number of years, and in 1975, we succeeded in growing it by a method that had previously been used uh, only in the laboratory on commercial grocery store mushrooms to study their genetics, but it turned out to be perfectly adapted for growing this mushroom. Within a matter of months, we had written Psilocybin, the Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide, and to... Uh, the information was moving out into society, but more important from our point of view was that the mushroom was again accessible to us so that we had psilocybin in a form that was certified pure by Mother Nature and that like initiated the second phase of uh, our work with these drugs, which has carried us up to the present day. And it's basically a project of taking the drugs, calling attention to uh, the differences, the uniqueness of the state, and trying to attract other people's attention to it because uh, I have, we have a very deep intuition of its importance for the cultural predicament for mankind generally. And uh, this is how we come to where we are today, basically. You just mentioned that the the mushroom is really important for our country right now. You perceive yourself as an advocate to bring in to our culture a new element, like uh, an easy way to reach alternative consciousness. What can we learn from these experiences? Well, the first thing that we can learn is that they exist. In other words, that uh, perhaps it's a truism in the 80s, but at one point uh, it was thought that there were two states of consciousness, awake and asleep. Now there is a gamut of these states, but I still don't believe that the people who deal with consciousness realize uh, how mutable consciousness really is. There is a prejudice against the use of drugs because there is an inherent dualism in, built into Western thought. 
where people value the experience if it is uh, endogenously produced, produced through ordeal or personality or uh, dieting, but is undervalued if it uh, comes from drugs. This has, in my opinion, held back the Western development of understanding consciousness because, quite simply, these states, I do not believe, are accessible by any means other than drugs. And this is heresy to a number of people, but the evidence that I lay in favor of that contention is uh, the history of uh, human art and literature and music and painting is surprisingly uh, empty of the motif which exists in the tryptamine-induced uh, ecstasy. And always when I speak of hallucinogens, I'm speaking of this limited family of drugs, not LSD or ketamine or mescaline, but psilocybin and DMT and combinational drugs which utilize strategies for making that effect uh, noticeable. And my career is to point at this place in nature, which I have stumbled upon, and to say, uh, what is this? What do you make of this? What do you, the physicist, you, the psychologist, you, the after-death researcher, what do you make of this uh, place? And uh, even the most sophisticated consciousness researchers tend to hurry over drugs or to focus on one drug to the exclusion of others, and yet psilocybin has not received this kind of attention and treatment. And why that is, I'm not sure. I think that... Uh, that the element of terror involved in doing it, the fact that it does not bathe your ego in a cloud of certitude or assurance that everything is going to be fine. It is much more cut and dried than that. And uh, it's a challenge. It is uh, when you are out in the billows, as I call it, because it seems to come in in waves like sets of billows. When you're out in the billows, you are against the power of mind, uh, up against the power of mind to such a degree that you know that the entire enterprise hangs in the balance, that no matter how much you've been told about dosage and this kind of thing, that the mind actually holds the key to life and death and that uh, those parts of your control board, which are normally masked from you, are suddenly unmasked, and the buttons are there for you to manipulate to the degree that you understand them. And uh, there is an element of risk. I never tell people that there isn't, but I think that the risk is worth it, because I think these bizarre dimensions of beauty and information are actually, uh, it is an intimation of these things that gives human history its coherency. In other words, this is not a peripheral issue to the general uh, phenomenon of human becoming in time. It is actually because the evolution of the human species is the evolution of the human mind, these consciousness-expanding agents actually anticipate uh, an end state uh, in the evolution of the human mind. And so they cast enormous reflections back over the historical landscape. It is they which generate uh, religions and physics and messianic careers and outbreaks of uh, uh, great psychic uh, accomplishment and uh, uh, disgrace. And uh, until we understand this, until we understand that there is a teleological object at the end of human history and that it can be known, we will continue to live the kind of limited intellectual existence that has characterized the last 500 years or so of Western development. 
psilocybin, tryptamine, is in my opinion the uh, the means to eliminating the future by becoming cognizant of uh, the architecture of eternity, which is modulating time and causing history, essentially. How do you perceive in this context the future of mankind and the human mind? Well, I've said many times, the human history is a, a lunge across 15 or 20,000 years of time from the primitive stone shipping primate to that creature which will walk into a transdimensional vehicle and leave the solar system and human history and the concerns of the human monkey far behind. And <clears throat> this may take a thousand generations of people, but as a biological fact, as a, an emergent process of planetary significance, that is only a, a microcosm, uh, I mean a microsecond of cosmic time. Uh, the immediate future of man lies in the imagination and in seeking the dimension where the imagination can be expressed. The present cultural crisis on the surface of the planet is caused by the fact that this is not a fitting theater for the exercise of imagination. It wrecks the planet. The planet has its own epistemic dynamics, which are not the dynamics of imagination. In space, the physical space that surrounds the planet, the modalities of imagination will be the limiting cases of what man can be done. So I see uh, man becoming an artist and an engineer, in other words, flowing into our ideas, perhaps more than we dare even now suspect, in other words, uh, a possible end state of that kind of technical uh, evolution would be uh, the interiorization of the body, of, of the human body, the individual body, and the exteriorization of the soul. And this seems to me to be what the recovery from Adam's fall uh, allegorically is getting at, that the soul must be made manifest and eternal, and the body must be incorporealized so that it is a freely commanded object in the imagination. And what I mean by that is uh, something like what William Butler Yeats is getting at in his poem, Sailing to Byzantium, where he speaks of the artifice of eternity and talks about how beyond death he would hope to be an enameled golden bird singing sweet songs to the lords and ladies of Byzantium. In other words, it's the image of the human body become a an indestructible cybernetic object. And yet, within that indestructible cybernetic object, there is a holographic transform of the body, and it is released into the dream. In other words, the after-death state is actually the compass of human history that we are attempting to undergo a complete death of the species. And as we struggle with this concrescence of Thanatos, there is there are problems like nuclear stockpiles and all these things arise because the message that we're trying to read is the message we most fear to hear, which is uh, that you must die to experience eternal life, essentially. But what this death that we're talking about is, is an understanding that the human, the Dasein, the being of human beings, desires to be released into the imagination. And until we confront death uh, with the attitude that it is the after-death state that needs to enter history, there will be a great deal of anxiety. It's like a birth. Uh, you know, a birth is a death. 
everything you treasure and believe in and love and relate to is destroyed for you when you leave the room uh, and you are launched into another modality, a modality that you would not perhaps have chosen, but that you cannot do anything about. So I, uh, I think these drugs anticipate this because I think that uh, time is the moving image of eternity, as Plato said, and uh, these drugs place you outside of time. Now, the mechanism of how that's done, you can invoke Bell's theorem, or just call it pure magic, but uh, it does happen in the here and now. It is accessible. It is not. Uh, it is not something remote from us. But somehow the clamor of the modern world and in search for answers, people have feared to place themselves on the line and to actually wrestle with life and death out there in those strange bardo-like dimensions, not realizing that there is no other way to win true knowledge, and it cannot be easily come by. There is no knowledge without risk-taking. And uh, I see the human future uh, emerging along the lines that the mushroom visions have insisted upon, the proliferation of electronic media, the densification of information, the breaking down of consensus reality, the uh, uh, breakdown of a coherent uh, dogma at the center of physics. All these things uh, indicate that it is slowly becoming understood that the modality of being is the modality of mind. And once that realization is placed in the center of someone's thinking about the world, the importance of these drugs will be seen to be paramount. And once that culture places that understanding uh, in the center of its model of the world, these drugs will then point the way uh, and we will be much closer to the end of history that I think we all uh, desire consciously or unconsciously, a, a cutting of the Gordian knot and a release of the human species and individual into the dream, basically. And to primitive people, meaning pre-literate people, they just have circumvented the entire process of history. They have leapfrogged over us. They are already in the dream. They have accepted the drug on its own terms and uh, and assimilated it and live with it. The problem with that, for them and for us, is that we are destroying their world and our intellectual equipment is such that we can never have that uh, that naive epistemological approach to these phenomena because we know about the technique, we know that energy can be manipulated to achieve effect. And so it isn't enough for us to try to recreate the, the shamanism of pre-literate people. We have to go into the shaman space with the a priori categories of Kant, with the eidetic reduction of Wittgenstein, with the ideas of Merleau-Ponty and Whitehead, all the intellectual equipage of our culture must be carried with us into that space to attempt to map it in a way that will be relevant for us and that will point the way toward a shortening of this period of uh, uh, shock and the accumulating shock waves, like the bow shock of uh, ionized particles or energetic particles meeting the magnetic field of the planet. That's what the chaos at the end of history is. Were you just talking about the bell theory? No, I'm talking about a shock wave which precedes eschatology and is the modern times, basically. I mean, it has been increasing throughout history, but as we grow closer to this moment, where uh, the human mind will evolve into hyperspace, uh, the confusion, the amount of contradiction, the amount of uh, 
well, Q it's called in engineering, just the amount of vibration in the system is increasing to the point where it seems like the system is about to fly to pieces. This signals to me that the onset of the uh, of the primal crisis, that when we have gone through it, we will then live in this uh, in this realm of altered understanding that psilocybin and these drugs anticipate. And it isn't a coincidence that they anticipate them. It is, uh, in fact, uh, what eschatological time is, is what they reveal. That's why the cultures we find using them are eschatological and historical uh, cultures. So what is the bell theory you were talking about? Well, the bell theorem is simply an interpretation of an experiment in quantum mechanics, which seems to suggest that information is non-local. In other words, that uh, everything about everywhere can be known here and now, because somehow all information is cotangent to every point in the matrix. I uh, don't uh, pretend to have the background to judge the bell theorem. What I would say about it is, if it isn't true, something like it must be true to account for the informational content of these uh, drug experiences. If you just take a simple behaviorist model, uh, what is in your head is behaviorist and reductionist evolutionists are correct. What is in your head should be very... Uh, adapted to the here and now. It should be efficacious information that bears on your survival. Instead, what we find when we uh, take these drugs is a density of information, an alienness of information, and an inapplicability of information to the human condition that suggests that information is available that has no bearing on the life of the individual or his uh, uh, the success of his evolutionary strategy. And I just cannot believe uh, that these things are built into the human psyche. I have, as I said, I was involved with Jungian ideas, and I those archetypes and those archetypal processes are not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... Uh, the thing which, for want of a better word, we call the alien or the extraterrestrial, the thing which comes out of the drug experience that is un-Englishable, beautiful, but so bizarre that it seems to exceed human categories. Some people talk about entities. Y yes, it can present itself as an entity. It can present itself in a number of different ways. It is... Uh, it is the central mystery of our age. We are so alienated. Uh, or let me restart that. The, <clears throat> the relationship of intellectuals alive today who are familiar with the state of modern science and that sort of thing to a question like the existence of extraterrestrials is approximately in the same place or degree of closure as the relationship of 15th and 16th century intellectuals to the real properties of matter. In other words, they had only a tenuous grip on the real properties of matter. And consequently, alchemy could exist, could project the hopes of human psychic transformation onto inert matter because so little was known about the real nature of matter that it seemed a reasonable place to expect these kinds of things to happen. The present state of thought uh, today is that it's highly likely that there are extraterrestrials somewhere around among the stars. Our state of, the state of the development of our chemistry, astrophysics, uh, uh, linguistics, etc., etc., makes it reasonable for us as moderns to expect that. So then consequently we go into our heads and there seems to be the extraterrestrial. Uh, it may be a true extraterrestrial, but it is odd that it has hidden itself in the place where we expected to find it. And this causes me to assume that actually it's something far more profound than an extraterrestrial. 
It's something which, to gain our confidence, is disguised as an extraterrestrial because its uh, real nature is so much more devastating than that, that that is the way in which it insinuates itself into our lives so that we can dream of a hegemony of organized intelligence out in the galaxy that we will relate to and be assimilated into. What I think is going on is that actually the most intelligent uh, life form on the planet is not uh, man and his institutions. It is the a, the overmind of the human species, which is a diffuse organism of uh, technical artifacts like computers and information transfer and retrieval systems and human beings. And it, it, but human institutions are like uh, myths woven by the individual human cells that make up society. The real controlling uh, modality on the planet is never visible, and it is this group mind, and it controls the release of ideas into history by designating certain people as geniuses, and it, uh, if, it, if there's a certain kind of imbalance, a certain kind of religion will arise to collapse that imbalance. If uh, if uh, technical advancement is outstripping the evolution of ethics, a religion can step in to freeze uh, these developments so that one can catch up with the other. And I think the whole consciousness movement and that has evolved over the past 20 years is an attempt to map, to verify and to open a dialogue with this thing, which is the other, we call it the other, we call it the alien, but it is actually the overmind of the species. And it, it seeks this dialogue. It has been waiting all these millennia to uh, for us to essentially come to a point of intellectual maturity where we did not then require messiahs, religions, and uh, these various crude, fine, cr- crude interventions into the human experience, which keep us from destroying ourselves. This is also what Jung called the collective unconscious. Right, but he he painted it as a very passive kind of thing, more like a data bank or a place where all myths and all memories were. I think of it as uh, a god a kind of God, and I think it, it uh, is active in three-dimensional space. It can be active in something as uh, personalistic and uh, circumscribed as uh, a string of coincidences which you experience, which seem to be turning your life in a certain direction that you may not have expected. Or it can be active... Uh, in, in something like the worldwide phenomenon, flying saucers. Flying saucers are nothing more than miracles, and uh, they occur essentially to be devil science, because science is a human institution that has arisen in the last 500 years that is uh, the dreams of displacing the overmind without ever realizing that it exists. Science dreams of this place of preeminence, uh, but science uh, creates alienation, um, species, survival problems, all of these things. Now then, the overmind, which can be thought of simply like a, a cultural thermostat, it clicks on when the clash of contradiction between the ethics of a society and uh, some other institution, in this case science, becomes too great, this governing device clicks on and it begins producing those events most destructive to the institution that is seeking preeminence, in this case science. So the inexplicability of the flying saucer phenomenon is its central uh reason for being, and all the effort to reduce it to something, uh, metal ships from far away or anything else, 
is doomed to failure because its very reason for being is to undermine those kind of ontological systems. Uh, why we're talking about this is because psilocybin makes in, inducts you into the flying saucer experience. In other words, a metaphor for it would be to say that psilocybin is a means of triggering the so-called abduction experience or the close encounter of a third kind. Uh, once you realize that, once you've satisfied yourself that that's true, a number of experimental avenues are opened up. A number of different approaches to what's going on are suggested. I mean, here we have alien entities eager to transmit information, eager to carry on a noetic dialogue, and uh, we seem to be ignoring the opportunity because our categories uh, mitigate against us correctly appreciating are these entities coming from outer space, or are they more part of us? It's like, impossible to tell. This is the game that you must play with them, is through dialogue, trying to figure out if this is uh, the previously unseen human psyche, or whether it is actually a thing coming from the outside. And it is not an easy thing to decide, because we are so alienated from stealth, that we don't really know what it would be. Yeah. So it's, it's not important to, to know the context. It's more important to know the content. Would be there. The content is very interesting, yes, because even if we were somehow to verify that Bell's non-locality theorem applied and that this, these were real entities around a real sun somewhere in the universe, it would make them no more or less real. In other words, it's a hang-up to to demand that they appear in three dimensional space, I always uh, I have this hang up, so I I don't uh, I don't put it down. I always think of the the apostle Thomas, because you'll recall Thomas was not present when Christ returned uh, after when he rose from the grave. He appeared to the apostles in the upper room, and Thomas was not present. Then later he was there and the apostle said, listen, the master was here and it was wonderful. And he said, you know, people have been smoking too many little brown cigarettes. That's preposterous. And at that point, Christ walked in and he said, he said, Thomas, come put your hand into the wound so that you will believe. And so he did. And so then he believed. Well, the moral of the story, as I read it, is uh, Thomas was the doubter. Consequently, Thomas was the only one who was allowed to actually touch the resurrection body. It was because he doubted that he was vouchsafed uh, this position of preeminence. And uh, I'm like that. I mean, I would like to touch the incorporeal body. I would like to call the saucer down and observe all of its workings. But uh, this is a spiritual aspiration that cannot be advanced by any uh, human technique or activity. This is just something you pray for. Uh, in the meantime, the job is to to map it and describe it and explore it and try to direct the attention of other people more intelligent than myself to this astonishing fact, really. I mean, I am I'm troubled by the fact that so many strange claims are made today, so many forms of aliens and channeling and voices in the head, that when I began all this ten years ago, I was afraid to speak because uh, I sounded mad even to myself, and I sounded like a voice in the wilderness. Today, the situation has changed to the point where uh, I can barely make myself heard amidst the clamor of people who have various uh, entities uh, from Atlantis and beyond the grave and Zeta Reticuli and uh, what have you clamoring to be heard. So I... Uh, 
I take it on faith, and I ask you to take it on faith, that I am uh, somewhat more objective and somewhat more interested in hard facts than these other channelers. I would like people to take a look at this phenomenon and then tell me what they think. And uh, it involves risk. People fear to do it. Careers are placed on the line. It is not easy to make a career out of taking a psychedelic drug. It is not a thing which mixes well with the politics of any institution, a university, a research institution. I don't think perhaps this is why shaman are the primary sources of the information about it. Are you, are you a shaman? Are you an exploring shaman? I'm an exploring shaman. I wouldn't claim to be a shaman, but I think anybody who takes these things and goes out and tries to navigate through and make maps and bring back data is a shaman for sure. Mm. Do you want uh, that everybody takes this drug on the side and takes the drug? Or? No, I don't think so. I think it's very... Uh, I think it's very dangerous. I do not tell people that it's safe because uh, I don't have the faith that it's safe. I know what the pharmacological literature says, and it says that it's safe, that at the doses where these effects occur, there can possibly be a problem. But this seems to me to be the naivete of materialism. And... Uh, We shouldn't be in a hurry to believe them, even though it might make us more comfortable to do so. In other words, it's saying, you know, the drug may not be toxic, but you may be self-toxic, and you may discover this on the drug uh, in the drug experience. So you have to uh, you have to hone yourself and be clean, and you never know if you're clean enough until it's too late. Because each journey into that dimension is uh, a total existential commitment. To, and uh, the element of fear is always there. I mentioned this this morning, but I think the fear validates it. I'm not, uh, I think it's fine to take drugs uh, for pleasure, but it should be labeled as taking drugs for pleasure. And the high doses of psilocybin that are necessary to elicit entry into these places, um, it requires, uh, as it says in Hamlet, you must screw your courage to the sticking place. Um, you mentioned earlier about mankind evolving towards a teleological goal. Would you comment on that? Well, I don't think I don't think there is a, a final goal and an end to history. But speaking relative to the history of the past four or five thousand years, I think the goal is, as I said, to invert the relationship of body and soul, so that the body becomes an image in the imagination. And the soul becomes an exteriorized, solid-state piece of circuitry which maintains everything else uh, in stasis. And uh, I'm not sure if people even realize what I'm picture in my mind when I say this, but I think that the destiny of man and what man will make be his destiny just because of the, how we are is release into the imagination. And this is what all our after-death scenarios say, whether they are true or not, and they may be true. And this is what poetry aspires to, art aspires to, release into the imagination. We are creatures of the dream. And once this is articulated with sufficient clarity, and it, it's happening now, but I think the work we do with these drugs, we are the the earliest pioneers in what over the next hundred years will lead to an understanding uh, of consciousness almost as a thing apart from the monkey body and brain. We are consciousness 
we may not always be monkeys. We fear the dehumanizing effect of so many computers and uh, emotions, euphoric emotions not related to sex and all these things. We fear them. We say we are moving further and further from nature, deeper and deeper into our own psyche. But this is a dualism. Uh, our psyche is nature. And we are not, we cannot move away from nature by exploring these places. So I believe, you know, that a technological recreation of the after death state is what history pushes toward. And that means a kind of eternal existence where there is an ocean of mind into which one can dissolve and reform from, but there is also the self. Uh, related to the body image, but in the imagination, so that we each would become, in a sense, everyone. I would live at Versailles, and uh, you might live at the Taj Mahal, and uh, someone else might live at Buckingham Palace, but what you would see, there, if there were an exterior observer, what you would see is only that man had become a coral reef of circuitry, in space and on the planetary surface. But uh, this is a very extreme view of the history of man because it's essentially Gnostic. It says we are not now what we yearn to be and are destined to be. We are, uh, we are not, I don't see history as the process of accepting and coming to terms with monkeyhood, I see that it will inevitably seek to transform and transcend monkeyhood. And uh, this will be very frightening. I mean, it's frightening. Imagine if a, even a 15th century person were to be in this room with us and the value systems, the clash of uh, assumptions about what is important and unimportant. And this will be a much more intense change, that, and whether it is good or bad rests on a question that I have no answer for. And the question is, is man good? And this, I maintain, is the central thing to dig at, and we cannot know, um, and there's evidence pro and con, I have the faith that man is good, so I don't, uh, I don't fear this future. But if someone had a doubt, even a, even a small doubt about that, then they would be repelled by this. And I take all these movements which want uh, zero-sum growth and uh, reject technology, reject space colonization, reject uh, drug experimentation as artificial, these people would be very alarmed by this kind of a point of view, but they do not seem to realize that the momentum toward this kind of thing is now so great in okay. terms of the human culture and that sort of thing that there can be no turning back. We are either going to change into this cybernetic, hyperdimensional, hallucinogenic angel, or we are going to destroy ourselves. The opportunity for us to be happy hunters and gatherers integrated into the balance of nature, that fell away 15,000 years ago and cannot be recaptured. I think uh, Gerard O'Neill made it in answer to this very objection. He said, the earth is the cradle of mankind. There is no question about that. But you do not remain in the cradle forever. And this is a, this is a birth crisis that we're going through. The entirety of human history has been the story of mon the monkey becoming the flying saucer. And it is taking just that long in geological time. But we, for some strange reason, happen to be living through the final moments of that process right now, and it is uh, a turbulent, chaotic, multidimensional um, metamorphosis that is uh, 
There's never been anything like it on this planet before. It's absolutely astonishing information, which was locked for uh, chiliocosms of time into the DNA of plants and animals, has through the hand and articulate voice of man uh, been able to bootstrap itself out of the DNA and into these culturally validated, rapidly operating electromagnetic codes and languages. And this is allowing its development, uh, its evolution, to proceed at a rate so fast that uh, the transformation is taking place essentially in our lifetime. And psilocybin is central to this because psilocybin casts a spotlight into the darkness into which we are moving and shows that uh, this is what lies there. It is uh, the human soul, essentially, the oversoul of mankind calling history toward itself across the dimensions. And it's taking only a moment, but on the other hand, it's taking 20,000 years. And it is the great great uh, adventure of becoming and we are very very privileged to be in this uh, final ticking out of the last seconds of the third act do you have any comments about the fact that uh, dmt is located in the human brain well i think that puts uh, in some sense is a strong piece of evidence for the argument that i've been making not only is DMT endogenous in the brain, but beta carbolines of the sort that occur in ayahuasca are endogenous in the brain as well. These things, as I mentioned this morning, the shift of a single atom on the ring structure of one of these molecules can cause a compound to go from inert to highly active. Well, that means then that it's probably very reasonable to say that we are as close to shifting the level of endogenous hallucinogens in our head, we are probably only a one gene mutation away from that happening. And uh, if you know anything about how biological evolution works, it isn't that uh, a change, a mutation occurs and the mutation is found to be better adapted than the previous form, and uh, uh, hence the mutation dominates. That is not the way evolution works. The way it works is you have the normal expression of the genotype in a population, and then you have mutations being thrown up all the time, and they are usually quenched, except in the situation where the environment shifts so that new selective pressures are operating in the environment. When new selective pressures begin to operate, a gene that was previously without consequence may suddenly have immense consequences. So then every member of the population that you're looking at that has that gene suddenly is in a much more advantageous uh, uh, position to advance their evolutionary strategy. And I think that certainly modern existence uh, has changed selective pressures on the human genome. And now uh, it is people who are far out that's simply a gloss. It is the people who are far out who are um, gaining advantage in the, uh, in the evolutionary jostling for efficacious strategies. And this, you're right, Frank, this is happening uh, on the hardware level, on the level of endogenous tryptamines and that sort of thing. I think schizophrenia is essentially, in a way, a disease of modern times, and it is, though it's always existed, of course, but the incidence of it and the incidence of uh, schizoid, if not schizophrenic, uh, uh, personalities and types is because the the modalities of evolutionary selection are shifting. It's as though if you think of a rainforest that has been above water 200 million years, all evolutionary niches have become occupied. Everything is at steady state. 
there is not going to be any dramatic uh, radiation of a new species because everything has been worked out and the energy flows are so tight, nothing can gain a leg up on that situation. <clears throat> but if you clear a thousand acres of forest and reduce it to uh, rubble, essentially open land, then what are called invader species come in there. And they very quickly gain dominance, where in the jungle, at steady state, you never see those plants. You never see weedy, annual, uh, heavily seeding plants in the jungle. The jungle strategy is for enormous plants, which produce small numbers of seeds. And this is, again, an analogy to the modern situation that uh, modernity is a desert. And we are jungle monkeys. And so new evolutionary selective pressures are coming to bear upon the human situation. New ideas are coming to the fore. Uh, psilocybin is a selective filter for this. The wish to go to space is a selective filter for this. Just the wish to know your own mind is a selective filter for this. But... Uh, this is this is part of the picture. This is what's happening. It's inevitable. It's a very good thing, I think, if you have faith that man is good. I mean, my uh, I I follow the Renaissance Platonists on that. I think man must be the measure of all things. What else could possibly serve with certainty? Um, so that's all I would say about that. You, you stated earlier that uh, psilocybin is, is coming from outer space, or that, that there's a possibility that this mushroom is... There's a possibility of that. Fred Hoyle <clears throat> and an associate of his have uh, come to my aid on this, saying that spore-bearing life forms, because spores have the capacity to survive in the conditions of outer space, that spore-bearing life forms may over truly large scales of time percolate out through the galaxy and serve as a basis for the evolution of life on various planets or insert themselves into already existing planetary ecologies and uh, insert themselves there. I don't, I, on these matters of specific fact, like is the mushroom an extraterrestrial and that sort of thing, I haven't the faintest idea the mushroom itself is such a mercurial, elusive, zen sort of personality that I never believe a word it says. I simply entertain its notions and try and sort through them. And I found that to be the most uh, enriching approach to it, to know that the option of believing that is there on hard evidence is very exhilarating. As to what is really going on, uh, the mushroom assures me that I haven't got even the faintest uh, grip on what is really going on. But something is going on. Uh, can I ask another question? Is it yeah. rough? Sure. What do you think is evil? And can these mushrooms be misused? Well, I think anything can be misused to... Uh, uh, most evil is, uh, trivial. And I, if I could speak off the top of my head, the only evil, uh, that associates itself with mushrooms is, uh, taking it but taking too little. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, <laughs> did you find evil? <laughs> evil, evil is uh, well, there's a word I want. Uh, it isn't twiddle, but <laughs> something like that. Evil is when you play at things, not in play in the Hindu cosmic sense, but where you fiddle with things, you muck with things because you don't want to get your feet wet. You want to be able to say you've done these things, but you never want to really place your validity on the line. 
And I am amazed at the number of people who claim uh, familiarity with psychedelic drugs, who when you actually question them closely, it's very clear that they have a sub-threshold dose. Even if they've taken it 50 or 100 times, they have managed through through low doses and strong defenses to always keep the demon at bay. That's the demon with a D-A-I. Mm-hmm. Keep the demon at bay, and they don't know what they're talking about. You must take a sufficiently large dose so that you enter into these places. Not to knock uh, him personally, because he's a very nice man, but as an example, uh, Roland Fisher, whose work you may know, I talked to him, and he has given psilocybin, he says, to about 15,000 people at NIMH, and uh, now he's retired to Mallorca. But, uh, Imagine. oh, you do? Yeah. And I said to him, I said, Roland, what do you make of it? I mean, what do you make of it? He said, well, what make of what? And I said, well, what do you make uh, just specifically of the hallucinations? You say you gave it to all these people, you took it to uh, six times. What happened when you closed your eyes and looked at the hallucinations? He said, I never closed my eyes. I was highly agitated throughout. And I just realized these things, which seem to me as natural as breathing, just slide right past people. I mean, of course you do not eat for a few hours before you do it. Of course you lie down in darkness and compose your mind and look at the darkness behind your eyelids. And of course you invoke it through the wish to have it come to you. These are things as simple as they can be. Yeah, here was a man with a lifelong professional involvement in it, published dozens of papers, has made contributions in the mapping of consciousness, but he could never just stop fidgeting long enough to uh, see it. So that's so my idea of that as evil. Evil is the, uh, anything which trivializes a mystery would be evil. And since this is a mystery, uh, any, uh, dismissing of it or constantly taking it at low doses for hedonic purposes. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the whole story, and nobody should think that that gives you a pedestal from which to uh, speak about it. You really have to do these heroic amounts and uh, and integrate them. This is something I haven't even talked about in this interview, but these things are very state-bounded, a term which Roland Fisher, in fact, coined. That simply means that they're very hard to retain and remember what exactly happened at the peak of the flash. And you come down and you say, well, it was very strange. There was information, there were entities, but I just can't get back to it. The way to overcome that is to be as psychedelic in your down one as possible. And by psychedelic, I mean ideas, cognitive activities. You should dance, you should read, you should think, you should paint, you should sculpt, you should converse. You should constantly involve yourself in cognitive activities because taking these drugs is one of the major cognitive activities. And then if you have a grip on human history, where the human enterprise has been, where it's going. If you have been many places, uh, it's easier to map. I'm, I'm reminded of there's an alchemical aphorism, I think it's attributed to Athanasius Kushner, where he says, uh, the oldest books, the farthest countries, the deepest forests, the highest mountain. This is where you must seek the stone. And what he means is you must simply acquire experience because it is only in the acquisition of acquired experiences that you have a reservoir to draw on when you seek to make metaphors and analogies about the, the alien thing. When you invoke the god, then you can map back onto it and say, well, It's like this, it's like that, knowing that it is not that or this, but 
the fund of analogies is there to give you a grip on. So there's an obligation to experience deeply and richly and thoroughly and intellectually. Uh, okay. And then uh, you can map back onto it. But it's a dialogue between you and it where you are discovering new things about yourself and it and trying to resolve the question, are we the same thing? And I haven't resolved the question. My suspicions flow one way and then another way. But I think it is without a doubt a living mystery existing in the presence, available to anyone sincere enough to uh, seek it. And for me, that was a life-transforming discovery and revelation because I didn't believe there were any mysteries. I believe there may have been once, but to discover one right in our midst, and it cannot be reduced, it cannot be uh, pulled apart into its constituent uh, uh, functions, it is truly a unitary mystery, and it's accessible in our lives right now without kneeling at anybody's feet, without following any regimen of, uh, of uh, denial or, uh, or the assimilation of any belief system. And uh, this is very big news. I think. The mystery has always been there, I'm sure. But our society is so bizarre and has led us so far astray that we have to rediscover it. And this process is happening. This is what the 20th century is all about. And we are still tiptoeing at the edge of it, even though great men, great women, great mappers of uh, consciousness have come and gone. We are still at the very infancy of this thing. And it calls out to us. It beckons. It says, do more, see more, know more, and uh, be more a, a part of it. Well, uh, you know, during your talk, I thought about one experience that uh, Rita and I had in India when we were in a family case. We were looking at the lingam, and, you know, when you would look out of the caves, you could see across the bay, which is an atomic plant. And these two things just look really identical. Well, the mushroom, could any symbol be more appropriate of the ambiguity of human transformation? What mushroom is it that grows at the end of history? Is it Stropharia cubensis or is it the creation of Edward Teller? This is an unresolved problem. <laughs> what a brew. <laughs> Is that effective? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs>